its power in such forms as to them shall the sea most likely to effect their safety and happiness. Surely, the right of the whole people to vote is here clearly implied. For however destructive it is their, in their happiness, this government might become, a disenfranchised class could neither alter nor abolish it, nor institute a new one, except by the old brute force method of insurgent and rebellion. One half of the people of this nation today are utterly powerless to blot from the statute books and unjust law or to write there a new one and a just one. The women dissatisfied Oh, as they are with this form of government that enforces taxation without representation, that compels them to obey laws to which they have never given their consent, that imprisons and hangs them without a trial by a jury of their peers, huh, that robs them in marriage of the custody of their own persons. Wages and children are this half of the people left woolly at the mercy of the other half, in direct violation of the spirit and letter of the declarations of the framers of this government, every one of which was based on an immutable principle of equal rights for all. By those declarations, kings, priests, popes, aristocrats were all alike dethroned and placed on common level politically with the lowliest born subject or serf. By them too, me as such, were deprived of their divine right to rule and placed on a political level with women. <laughs> By the practice of those declarations, all class and caste, distinction will be ab abolished and slave, serf, wife, women, all alike, bound from their subject position to the proud platform of equality. The preamble of the federal constitution says, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States of America. It was we, the people, not we, the white male citizens, not yet we, the male citizens, but we, the whole people, the people who formed this union. And we formed it not to give the blessings or liberty, but to secure them not to the half of ourselves and the half of posterity, but to whole people, women as well as men. And it is downright mockery to talk to women of their enjoyment of, of these blessings of liberty while they are denied the use of the only means of securing them provided by this Democratic Republican government, the ballot. said <laughs> Rochelle Palash, but actually Susan B. Anthony, if any of you recognized uh, her closing argument in a case I'll tell you about in a minute. Good morning. Thank you all for being here to celebrate the launch of our Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission. It's going to be a great year, 2020. That's our year. Uh, at first, before I go any further, thank you to Nikita Waller, our state troubadour. I think she had another engagement. Is she still here? There she is. All right. All right. 
Wonderful spirit, wonderful voice. Look forward to hearing more from her in the future also. Um, and also, I will, uh, we will hear from our co-chairs in a minute. I am Denise Merrill, Secretary of the State, and uh, co-chairing this commission uh, effort with our First Lady, Annie Lamont, and our Lieutenant Governor, Susan Beisowitz. More from them in a moment. Uh, so, as you just heard, Susan B. Anthony made quite the case for women voting. She made the case because she was arrested. Uh, she voted illegally in 1872, 40 years before women were finally enfranchised. And she was arrested and tried in court for voting, being then and there a person of the female sex, which she well knew, according to the indictment. <laughs> so clearly, these were not shrinking violets, these ladies. Uh, they did remain ladies for quite a long time. It was a very long struggle. From Seneca Falls to the final passage of the 19th Amendment was 70 years. And it went through many iterations. At first, they were quite ladylike, really. And then later on, not so much. So today, as I was getting dressed for this occasion, I thought, wow, I'm taking a risk. White after Labor Day. And then you look at the risks these people took, you know, like, like this one, getting arrested for voting illegally. Of course, in my role, I always wonder how that actually happened. They shouldn't have let her vote, but whatever. <laughs> but they did other things that were very risky. For example, they took off their corsets. And by the way, those corsets were made in the corset capital of the United States. Anybody here from Norwalk? <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> they picketed. They picketed the White House. That was later on. They picketed Wilson's White House, went to jail, did starvation uh, diets, were force fed. One woman died in prison. This was not a group of ladylike shrinking violets. This was a very long and intense struggle that took many forms. And what interests me about it is that they learned to do politics, small p. They were arguably the first organizers ever in this country because they learned how to do things like media, white outfits, um, later on many other posters and uh, events where they made their point. So, and lobbying. They pretty much invented lobbying, actually. Um, so, for me, in particular, I feel at home here in the chamber because I stand on the shoulders of these women. And I will be forever grateful. And I look around the room and I see several of my colleagues, my former colleagues, who are now also at home in this chamber. So it's heartening to look around and see what women have won for themselves over the last hundred years. Today, we celebrate those victories. There's still much to be done. Uh, during the celebration, we're also going to look to the future, not just to the past, and ask ourselves how we are going to continue this fight for equality and democracy. So first of all, I would like to uh, allow our two co-chairs to come forward and uh, let you know their thinking about this commission. And so I will turn first to our Lieutenant Governor, Susan Bysowitz, dear friend and great collaborator. Thank you. Well, good morning, and thank you, Madam Secretary, for your remarkable efforts in bringing us all together. But I think it's important for us to know who these important leaders are that have joined us today. Uh, so can we, if you are a mayor or first selectman, stand up, because we have a lot of those. Thank you so much. I note a lot of women amongst you. Our legislative leaders, please stand up. And Mary Abrams with those, with, with the future in her hands, very beautiful. Um, we have state commissioners and administrators with us, please stand up. 
Uh, we have community activists of all stripes. Please stand up. I think that's everybody else. Um, and we also have some historians, and we don't want to forget them because if we don't learn our history, then we're apt to be repeating ourselves, right? So our historians, can you stand up? Thank you all uh, so much uh, for coming out to celebrate our centennial of women's suffrage. Um, Annie and I are so excited to be co-hosting this important uh, celebration. All of us are longtime advocates for the empowerment of women. And I think one of the most influential ways we can accomplish this is by exercising our right to vote and encouraging all women to do the same. We are a state that values the contributions of women. And we have had some trailblazers here. Uh, we were the first state in our nation to elect a woman governor in her own right, and that was? Excellent, and we just celebrated what would have been her 100th birthday this year in May. So we have been at the forefront in many ways of uh, respecting and appreciating women in leadership. Um, let me tell you that uh, Governor Lamont uh, respects and supports women in leadership. And so we are so proud to have a historic team in place that includes 52% of our executive uh, leadership team are women and 40% are people of color. That is historic and we are very, very proud of our team. Another example of our governors and our state's commitment to uh, the rights of women is that uh, very shortly after the two of us were sworn into office, the governor created the Governor's Council on Women and Girls to uh, advance uh, the interests, not just of women and girls, but of families uh, across our state. And the purpose of that is to engage each of our state commissioners uh, and our legislators and constitutional officers in creating a coordinated state response and policies to advance the issues of women and girls. And I like to say that women's issues are economic issues and we've already had some success uh, raising our minimum wage to $15 an hour, passing the Paid Family Medical Leave Act. And can I just give a shout out to our girlfriends, Robin Porter and Julie Kushner. Stand up, ladies. Uh, thank you for your leadership. You helped us get that done. And there is so much work to do, and our Council on Women and Girls is creating a list of those legislative initiatives uh, and policies. Um, but back to what we're here for. Um, one of the greatest accomplishments, I think, of our democracy is the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which happened uh, just about 100 years ago. Um, but while we're here to acknowledge uh, what it did, let's not forget uh, what it didn't do. While it afforded millions of white women access to the ballot box, African American women and women of color were not afforded those rights until decades later with the passage of the Civil Rights Act. So uh, we uh, remember that and we keep that in mind. And all women, even those that were granted the right to vote in the 1920s, still struggle every day for the basic opportunities uh, that we should enjoy as Americans, uh, especially since we make up 51% of the population, yet we are not represented fully 
in the highest levels of our state and national government and in Fortune 500 companies in the nonprofit world. And so we have much more to do and that's why we need your help and your leadership. Uh, we are so committed to reminding people that they need to vote, but they need to vote because there is more work to do in terms of healthcare, in terms of achieving pay equity so that women can make dollar for dollar what men make. That is still not a reality in our state and in our country. And uh, at the national level, our right of access to health care, to reproductive rights and freedoms and equal opportunity are still under attack. So ladies and gentlemen of taste and discernment, we have much more work to do together. We thank you so much for joining us today and I hope you leave here motivated and excited to help us celebrate this important historic milestone, but also understanding how much more work we have to do in our communities, in our state, and in our country. And I am so confident that with all of your help, we will be able to do that. And uh, I am so pleased to welcome at this time, my friend, the first partner, Annie Lamont. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. You know, it's a little hard after Susan B. Anthony's words to really, you know, you just, you just want to let that sit and think about it. Um, but, I, you know, I think we've all had our own awakening uh, at times, and, you know, we think we've made so much progress, and then we look around and something, you know, uh, you know, hits us in the face, and we go, wait, wait a minute. Um, I entered, entered the venture world uh, over 30 years ago. Venture was a small, all-male club, and I was lucky to be admitted to that club very early in my career. I have loved every minute of my career, happily helping entrepreneurs build successful companies that hopefully have had positive impact on the world. The one thing that I didn't love was looking around after 30 years and seeing that almost no progress had been made, both in terms of the number of female venture capitalists and the number of female entrepreneurs, which is to say almost none. I mean, we're literally four to five percent of female partners in venture firms um, across the country. Um, and it just didn't make sense to me. I, women have all the natural attributes to be great investors. And it's an industry where you can measure and quantify your results. So it was really all about access. Uh, and it was about getting women in. And because if they get in, I was confident they would perform and succeed. So when I created my own firm five years ago, uh, I was finally in a position to change things. And I recruited the best people I could find. No compromise, absolutely not. Uh, and no surprise, that means actually over half of my partners are women. Um, and okay. and you know it's interesting. Um, just an aside, you know, as we're recruiting associates, I'm still talking to recruiters and getting 20% of women to fill the younger positions. And to me, that is just wrong. So we've literally, you know, I just say, okay, the next one, I know the talents out there. The next one is going to be a female and we're gonna find the best person out there and um, we can make this right. Um, so we're slowly chipping away in our own little, little world. Um, but it, it is important to lead by example. And when you find yourself in a position where you can affect change, you have to take on the responsibility to do so. Um, the fascinating thing about the suffragettes, you know, which we've, you know, we know, we've heard this morning, is that they, they were never gonna get the right to the vote unless they broke the doors down, right? They had to break glass. And this wasn't a matter of like sneaking into the club and then, you know, being part of it. Um, changing hundreds of years of societal expectations and discrimination could never be accomplished from the inside. These women risk everything by challenging conventional norms and suffered the wrath of those who wanted to preserve the status quo, men and women. 
Um, suffragettes were on what the tech world refers to as the bleeding edge, um, which becomes the leading edge and then becomes the standard or the norm. And this is what progressives do. They change the world by daring to do the uncomfortable and unpopular thing. And this is just what my husband's administration has been focused on since day one, challenging the status quo to make Connecticut stronger and better in every way, including Ned's push to have more women, as Susan referenced, and people of color, and from the private sector who look at the traditional challenges we face in new and innovative ways. I read uh, Sandra Day O'Connor's biography this summer, and if you haven't, I, I highly recommend it. Um, I was reminded that it wasn't that long ago that a woman who was number two in her class at Stanford Law School could not get hired by any law firm in this country. Um, and, that, you know, if you think about how far Justice O'Connor came and the world came during the course of her life, her story demonstrates that progress comes slowly or in fits and starts, and you sometimes need to make some noise to jumpstart movements that when momentum has stalled. We need that in business, as I found looking around 30 years later and just thinking that I was in the industry I got in, why can't others get in? Well, sometimes you need to make some noise. And, you, and, you know, and it's interesting, if you think about different movements out there, we're, we're now beginning to make progress in my world. Um, and let's face it, we, we needed that in business, in government, in healthcare, and every corner of the world. The lack of progress by women in the industry over the last 30 years showed me that one can never be complacent. Thank you to my husband for always supporting my career. That was incredibly important to me. And to all those suffragettes who led the way, who fought to give women their core rights as citizen and whose vision and bravery continue to inspire generations of women. They certainly inspired me. Thank you. We are very lucky to have such a first lady, and uh, yeah, let's make some noise. That's what we're going to do this year. All right. So, I want to take us back for a minute uh, to the speech excerpted from SEIU's Rochelle Palash this morning, delivered earlier. The speech is impassioned and urgent. It's clear that Susan B. Anthony believed in what she was fighting for. So let's look at why we're here today. And I will say we invited people from every town in the state. And some of you, I think, are here on the behest of your town, which is great. And we invited historians and uh, members of the commission, which I want to introduce before I go any further. I will just give the names of the organizations. We have reached out to uh, a a broad group of uh, people and organizations who are going to help us lead this, uh, this year, uh, this commission's work. Uh, and I'll just read them off quickly. And I know there are some uh, members of these in, uh, institutions here today. So after I read them off, if you all stand, that would be great. Uh, American Association of University Women, the Connecticut Girl Scouts, the Connecticut Historical Society, the Connecticut Humanities Council, uh, Connecticut Now NOW, uh, Connecticut State Library, the Connecticut Women's Hall of Fame, uh, the Connecticut Women's Education and Legal Fund, Delta Sigma Theta, the Hispanic Federation, the League of Women Voters, of course, and they are celebrating their own 100th year anniversary uh, this year, and NAACP, the National Collaboration of Women's History Sites, Service Employees International Union, the Community Foundation for Greater New Haven, Women in the Law from the Connecticut Bar Association, the Yale Women's Campaign School, all the YWCAs, the, library, the Connecticut Library Association, ACOMAT, Educational Inst uh, Initiative, a Native American uh, Commission, uh, and all the Seroptimists around the state. So thank all of those groups. And if anyone is here from any of those organizations, can you please stand? Thank you very much for participating with us. Thank you. It's a great group. And I, I should say before I go further that the, the mission of our commission is really to uh, kind of be the focal point for the celebration uh, and to provide resources, which I'm going to tell you about in a minute. But I thought it might be um, a good idea to actually read the thing we're all here about today, and that's the 19th Amendment. And I found that I had not read it recently, 
Have you? <laughs> it's very short, bear with me. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Seems so simple now, doesn't it? That's why we're here today. You cannot be denied the right to vote because of your sex. That short statement enfranchised 30 million American women. It is the largest expansion of democracy in the history of the country. And that's what we're celebrating. And of course, I would not be standing here at this podium without the work of these incredible people that went before us. And there's a lot of them. And many of them were from Connecticut. They play, we played a very pivotal role in this fight. And um, that's what I'm hoping the towns will dig into and help us celebrate. So I'm gonna quote one of those women, Mary Mather Hooker, Republican from Hartford, elected in 1920, the first ever woman to speak on the floor of this chamber. You wanna hear her first quote. We women want the men in the house to feel that they may smoke, just as if there were no women legislators present. <laughs> I'm afraid when we found this out, it, it's not exactly auspicious, is it, you know, as a maiden speech. But I guess you can glean some things from that. They were still trying to be nice and ladies and, you know, make sure the men felt comfortable with them being in the chamber. Well, we don't quite expect the men in the chamber to carry on as if we're not here anymore, do we? <laughs> men, you may not smoke, not here or anywhere on our beautiful capital. And yes, there are women legislators present. In fact, they're here today. I know some of you stood up before, but let's stand up, just reiterate the point, ladies. <laughs> Thank you for being here. And yes, we are in record numbers. Still not enough. There's still, we hover around 30% elected uh, women in the House and Senate in Connecticut. I'm gone up a little lately, but you know, we've got a long ways to go. Um, and we'll keep trying. And we're hoping that this celebration will help us convince women that it's important to run for office. Not only just to vote, run for office and be part of the leadership team. So Mary Hooker, um, whose quote I just read was from Hartford, served on the Connecticut General Assembly, was also on the Hartford Board of Education, much like many women come into politics through boards of education, I know I did. And there was uh, Josephine Bennett, whose iconic photo you see up on the screen, was also uh, from Hartford. She was called Hartford's mother. So any Hartford people in the audience, you played, your, your four mothers played a very pivotal role in this fight. Nope, I don't see anyone. Another Hartford native, Grace Kellogg, was an independent member of the House of Representatives from 21, 1921 to 1923 and was pastor of the Nipog Con Congregational Church. That was very unusual at the time to have a woman uh, as the pastor at a church. Anybody from Canterbury here? I know usually uh, Joni, yes, there she is. The Prudence Crandall Museum, in case you don't know about it, is a wonderful place to visit a historical part of Connecticut. Uh, she, you will be proud to know that Lillian Frink, a native of Canterbury, was one of the first five women to serve in the legislature in 1920. She served a second term from 1943 to 1949. Apparently, she had a second career there. Like many of her counterparts, she was a Republican and served on the Republican State Central Committee. Tolland, little old Tolland, boasts the only Democrat among the first five women elected. Her name was Helen Jewett elected in 1920. See a pattern here? 1920 was a big year for us. She served for 35 years on her Board of Education and served as Secretary of the Rationing Board during World War II. In fact, I can think of one woman in particular whose life was almost certainly affected by Helen Jewett's trailblazing, another female legislator leader from Tolland. Do we know? Nancy Wyman. Right. 
And of course, there's Margaret Morton of Bridgeport. Any Bridgeport he people here? I wasn't there. Oh, Blanche, yes. <laughs> yes, first African-American woman elected not only to the House, but later to the Senate as well. And Maria Sanchez, another trailblazer for Hartford to claim, was the first Latina woman to be elected to the General Assembly. And of course, we're forever in indebted to the fearless El Grasso of Windsor Locks. And I know Windsor Locks has already has started a celebration because it is the 100th anniversary of her birth. So, we have lots of leadership here in Connecticut. There are many more that you will learn about as we go through the year, but it's true. We sit in the shade of trees we did not plant, and we drink from wells we did not dig. These women paved the way for bold, progressive change, and it is for them and for future generations that we convene this celebration and carry out the work of this commission. So our goal is to be, as I said, more or less a clearinghouse. We may host a few events along the way, but we're counting on you, honestly, to help us carry out uh, the goals of this commission. So we invite you to help your town celebrate this landmark, whether it's a town official, family, small business, anyone can participate. Um, and so I'm gonna go over the resources that we're providing already, actually, on our website. Um, and it's already very nuanced. I'm learning a lot, I know. Uh, there's a list of reading you can do, and it's very enlightening. I, I found that I didn't know nearly as much about all this that, as I thought I did. Uh, it's an amazing story, and it reads like a dramatic novel. So, and before I do that, I want to thank my staff for their work on this, particularly Shannon Wegley, who was probably the one that contacted most of you. Thank you, Shannon, wherever you are, making things happen. This is really her brainchild. <laughs> okay, I'm going to give you a, uh, a brief overview of our commission and what we can offer to you throughout the year. And as I say, we're counting on you to help us here. First, the website, um, which is right up there votesforwomenct.com. Uh, you'll find a resource page with school curricula for all ages, lecturers, performers who can be invited to events, and toolkits with detailed advice on how to host a meaningful celebration in your community. Uh, also on the website, you'll find a portal where you can submit uh, your own suffrage-related events, which we'll publish on a comprehensive statewide calendar. So those are the obvious basics, right? We have an email list, hopefully you'll sign up today, and we'll send you updates when there's an upcoming event or something in your area uh, or anything else we, that comes to our attention. So, um, it's also, this year is about collaboration. And uh, we're especially excited to be collaborating with the Department of Education, and the commissioner is here today, and we'll give him a few minutes to speak uh, in a little while about what we're doing with them. Um, but the, the big thing is that the National Archives in Washington is currently displaying an exhibit titled Rightfully Hers. If you're down in Washington, I would encourage you to go see it. It's wonderful. It details the whole suffrage movement and the fight for the ballot box. So in collaboration with the Department of Education, my office has made available to every town in Connecticut a traveling version of this exhibit. So make sure you take advantage. We're excited to see it hopefully displayed in schools, libraries, public spaces throughout the year. And um, you can learn all about it on the website. We've also produced and shared with you a town suffrage toolkit, iteration of the toolkit created by the National Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission. There is a national commission as well. In this, you'll find in your folder, uh, which is uh, we talk about it in the folder, links to useful resources, uh, all kinds of ways to get your community involved, including, you know, offering awards or uh, symbols of the suffrage uh, centennial. Uh, some towns are planning parades. Uh, we may, my favorite idea is to have to reinvent re the March for Women and have it be a reinvention of the uh, suffrage parade, which was one of the signal events in the fight for suffrage that made such a difference. And if you ever see the picture of it, there's an iconic photograph, and what's striking about it is the white, because all the women are marching in white, and all the suits around them are all very dark and black. It's, it was a, it, it really it was a single-handed move that was, I guess, political, you could say, using media to make your point. 
and it's a, it's a wonderful photograph, and I would encourage you to maybe see it and uh, reproduce it. We have a way to do that in our toolkit. Uh, one last thing before I leave you and introduce our next speaker. We're launching a texting platform. I'd love for all of you to join up to receive updates. Um, and I think there's an image. Uh, it's, it's in the packets. You can join texting VOTE100 to 474747. I'm not sure I could tell you exactly what that means. Oh, there it is. Okay. It's up there on that screen. And that's how you can get in touch with us through social media. And if you want to, you can even, I don't have my phone with me. I'm supposed to take out my phone and show you how it's done, but I, I guess you guys can figure that out. So the First Lady, uh, Lieutenant Governor, and myself, we all hope you'll take these resources I mentioned very seriously, use them to engage your town in a meaningful celebration. Connecticut played an incredible role in this event, and uh, we should make sure we, we Remember the people that participated, many of them from very small Connecticut towns. How did that happen? You, you have to ask yourself. You know, in a day when you didn't have TV, you, you didn't really even have radio at the beginning. You know, how did this movement spread the way it did? It's a question worth asking. So, um, as I said, we've asked each town to send a designee. Uh, and hopefully some of you in this room will be that designee, and so you'll hear from us after today to establish those designees and take the next step. We must remember also that the 19th Amendment, although a giant leap forward, was only part of a long march to inclusive democracy. That march continues today, right here in this chamber. I myself have participated in a number of bills, expanding the franchise, making it easier to register and vote. I can't wait to work with all of you to help us with that work and to help the population in Connecticut renew its commitment to democracy. That's what I feel we're doing here. Because as I say, the largest leap forward ever was the enfranchisement of 30 million women at the time. And uh, today, women vote in larger numbers than men. Uh, like I say, we're still not there with equal representation, I don't think, but we're getting there. And with your help, we'll do even better. So thank you all for being here today. And uh, now I'm going to um, ask that some of our partners come up and speak. So first, I'd like uh, Joni DiMartino to come up. She is with the National Collaboration of Women's History Sites. And she will tell us all about a more national picture, I think, on this whole celebration. Joni, thanks for being here. I was a little nervous at first about doing this, but then I realized it only comes around every 100 years. <laughs> I would like to thank Secretary Merrill for creating the Connecticut Suffrage Centennial Commission and Lieutenant Governor Susan Bicewitz and First Lady of the State Annie Lamott for serving with Secretary Merrill as co-chairs. It is an honor to serve Connecticut as a member of this commission, and I do so in my role as the state coordinator for the National Votes for Women Trail, an initiative started by the National Collaborative for Women's History Sites and the Marker Program, funded through the William G. Pomeroy Foundation. I'd like to take a few short minutes to share with you what the National Votes for Women Trail is how Connecticut is participating, and what the cr criteria is for site consideration for a Pomeroy Foundation marker. The National Collaborative for Women's History Sites was created by representatives of more than 20 historical sites linked to American women and devoted to preserving women's history, including the National Park Service. The mission of the collaborative is to, quote, support and promote the preservation and interpretation of sites and locales that bear witness to women's participation in American life and to make women's contributions to history visible so that all women's experience and potential are fully valued, unquote. With the landmark anniversary of the 19th Amendment approaching, the collaborative created a Heritage Trails Committee their first initiative to highlight the role of each state in the 72-year national battle to achieve votes for women. As described in the Collaborative's 2016 annual report, quote, 
The Votes for Women Trail identifies the buildings, sites, historical markers, and monuments where women's suffrage activities took place. The locations and accompanying descriptions will be made accessible to the public via a mobile-friendly website. Sites will include those important to minority women, men who supported suffrage, and also anti-suffragists. The Votes for Women Trail's ultimate objective is to show how social change occurs, to honor the suffrage movement's countless participants, and to um, inspire future generations to treasure their right to vote. The Votes for Women Trail is a national grassroots effort to document a national grassroots effort that dramatically expanded democracy in our country. The suffrage campaign was conducted in parlors, churches, town halls, parks, union halls, and other community locations. While a handful of sites associated with the most well-known suffrage leaders have been turned into museums, the vast majority are unknown to the general public. Professional historians, women's history enthusiasts, educators, and students will all be able to utilize the Votes for Women trail for their research." Unquote. A year later, the collaborative partnered with the William G. Pomeroy Foundation to establish a new historic marker program commemorating the history of women's suffrage in the United States. The Pomeroy Foundation, which is a private grant-making foundation based in Syracuse, New York, provides grants through its National Women's Suffrage Marker Program in order to support the recognition of historically significant people, places, or things instrumental to women gaining the right to vote in 1920. Pomeroy Foundation signage grants, and I want to make this clear, are fully funded and cover the entire cost of the marker, the pole, and the shipping. The local partner is responsible for installation of the marker. The seven-foot cast aluminum markers are white with purple lettering and border. The collaborative's logo appears in gold at the top. Each state is offered up to five historic markers with this grant process. State coordinators, which is my role, work with local community partners to locate and confirm through primary resources a site's connection to a person, activity, or building connected to the suffrage movement. These locations will be added to the National Votes for Women Trail. However, only five sites in Connecticut will be granted a marker, which will undergo a more detailed review process. The Pomeroy Foundation is clear about their criteria for marker acceptance. The Suffrage Marker Program recognizes, quote, sites related to people and organizations who have shown an enduring engagement in suffrage activities. Involvement must be demonstrated in a tangible way. Sites related to people who were only peripherally involved in suffrage will not be considered." Unquote. So the process will be to contact me first with a suffrage or anti-suffrage connection in your community to place on the trail. Afterwards, all trail sites that want to be considered for a marker will be reviewed by the Commission's History Advisory Committee for potential nomination to the National Collaborative for Women's History sites, which must give the final approval before the site is recommended to the Pomeroy Foundation for a marker. The installation of the marker can include a dedication event, and of course, that's the fun part. There are two approval stages, both on the state and the national level, and one goal is, of course, to ensure the accuracy of the nominations. However, what is just as crucial is to make sure that the complete story of Connecticut's participation in the suffrage movement is told in the people, events, and locations the markers honor. Both the Connecticut Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission and the National Collaborative of Women's History Sites are committed to documenting the suffrage history of all those who worked for 72 years to make the 19th Amendment a reality. And this includes African Americans, Native Americans, working class people, and immigrants. Finding sites that help tell this broader story is part of what makes this project so important, not only to commemorate people in the past, but also to shape our vision of the future.
I'm eager to work over the next year with many different regions and communities throughout Connecticut as we discover the diverse voices and perspectives in our own state that lent their energies and talents to the continued and continuing struggle to expand democracy, to bring this hidden history, as the suffragists themselves would say, forward into light. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joni. So I hope we'll have um, a lot of interest in the uh, markers, and we are thinking of having a Connecticut version of the markers as well. So hopefully that will spark some interest uh, locally in historic figures. Uh, next, I'd like to ask our uh, new-ish Commissioner of Education uh, to come forward and talk about um, their vision of what they're doing for this celebration. So, Commissioner. Wow, humbled and honored to be here with these giants here. How about a round of applause? So thank you, Lieutenant Governor, First uh, Lady, and Secretary of the State. I'm inspired this morning. I'm so inspired. You've given me a reason to go out and buy a white suit. <laughs> I will. I find it striking but not shocking that over the last 40 years, women have turned out in higher numbers than men to vote in presidential elections. Yet, a little over a century ago, women could not have legally exercised this right that we may take for granted today. As a proud father of a 13-year-old daughter, the fact is not lost on me. I'm grateful that when my daughter turns 18, the only struggle she'll have is to find out which candidate and which issue she wants to stand behind. While we all need to fully appreciate the boldness and leadership of our most famous suffragette, Susan B. Anthony, the majority of us are probably much less familiar with the activism of Frances Ellen Burr, who was only 22 years old when she started, and Isabella Beecher Hooker, the less famous sister of Harriet Beecher Stowe, author of the anti-slavery novel Uncle Tom's Cabin. Both of whom were leaders in the suffrage movement right here from Connecticut. In these less famous suffragettes, whose contributions were just as important to the movement, whose stories need to be told because they're central figures in Connecticut's voting rights history. A story that will benefit our students, both female and male, as they learn about the state's contribution to this monumental effort. That's why I'm so grateful for the partnership of Secretary Merrill on several initiatives like, like Connecticut's Kid Governor that are no doubt fun, but also prepare our students to become fully informed, responsible, and active citizens through innovative, relevant, and engaging curricula. My daughter was a, a finalist in her school for the Connecticut Kid Governor, and I'll tell you, I remember her, this was about four, three, four years ago, I remember the passion she came home with talking about her project. It brought out a sense of pride and agency in my daughter that I hadn't seen before. Another joint initiative is the Red, White, and Blue Schools. The program inspires students to take social studies out of the classroom and into their local communities. In fact, this year's Red, White, and Blue Schools theme focuses on the history and legacy of the women's suffrage movement and voting rights as it pertains to our own state. As an educator, I know it's much more impactful for students to learn about subject matter that resonates with them. Students become more engaged when they explore local and state historical roots in such a monu monumental topic as women's suffrage. They can actually see themselves in the history. We've been hearing from a lot of educators who are excited about teaching this topic. In the coming months, the State Department of Education will be holding webinars and training sessions to prepare them to teach the women's suffrage movement and voting rights from a Connecticut perspective. We'll also dedicate a page on our website to useful resources, teaching aids, sample lessons, to further support our social studies educators in this important endeavor and work with Secretary Merrill's office to distribute educational tools from the National Archives Museum, Rightfully Hers, American Women, and The Vote exhibit to our school districts. I would love to have it connect somehow to the Votes for Women website to make those resources uh, connect with one another. And how powerful would it be to offer and make available to our, all of our schools in Connecticut, our high schools, a women's suffrage course for high school students. Wouldn't that be great? 
That wasn't in my notes, but it will be on my agenda. By stressing the importance of teaching civics throughout students' education and in varied and innovative ways, we're also encouraging them to be active and engaged members of their community throughout their lives. If we can get our students excited about the education they're receiving now, and we'll be better positioning them for a successful college and career and life. So Secretary Merrill, when you need a partner in this important work, like the troubadour saying, signed, sealed, delivered, we're yours at the State Department of Education. So honored to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Wow, isn't he great? Warms my heart as an old teacher, former teacher, sorry. <laughs> former social studies teacher, for that matter. Uh, and thank you. Finally, uh, lastly, we'll have Eileen Frank from the Connecticut Historical Society come and tell us a little bit about what they're doing for the celebration. Eileen. Hello, everyone. Um, a voice and a vote is what Susan B. Anthony asked for. And it is what we in Connecticut want to raise up. The only way that this statewide celebration is going to be successful is if we collaborate and if we find those local stories to raise up and to raise the profile of Connecticut's role, both the anti-suffragists and the suffragists who work so hard around the passage of the 19th Amendment in August of 1920. There are several things that the Connecticut Historical Society, the State Historical Society located here in Hartford are doing. We have partnered with the Connecticut Women's Hall of Fame, thanks to a funding through the Connecticut Humanities Council, um, to create a traveling banner exhibit called Rise Up Sisters. There will be two versions of this exhibit that um, are available for you to bring to your town, your library, your school, your historical society, your town hall. Um, and that will be uh, organized logistics through the Women's Hall of Fame. And those are going to be available later this fall. Um, at the Historical Society, we're developing a full slate of programming, including bringing speakers in and traveling programs that we can also come and deliver again to your communities to talk about Connecticut's role in this movement. As well as I know so many of the town historical societies, I was talking to my friend from Ridgefield, um, are also in their towns already working on developing programming, sometimes collaborative with their town historian or their library, to bring the programs um, that our communities want to hear. Um, and I just found out, if you have not read the book The Woman's Hour by Emily Weiss, um, which is fantastic, um, Emily Weiss is coming to Ridgefield in April 2020, and I'm, it's already on my calendar. I think it's going to be amazing. So we've heard some of the names of the women who were involved in this, and there are many Connecticut women like Alice Paul and Catherine Flanagan and Catherine Houghton Hepburn who were very, very active. These are women who had standing, who were white, and whose records have been recorded. And one of the things as we enter into this centennial is the realization that museums are not neutral and the collections that we hold have been generated by the people who donated objects. There were many women of color who participated in this movement. There were organization like, organizations like the Colored Women's League of Hartford, whose archives have not been as well preserved or has, have been lifted up. And that's one of the call of actions that I am here to present, is we need to be looking in our town records, in the newspapers, in our church basements, in our family basements, to find the records of these individuals and to bring those archives to light. Um, it is something that at the Historical Society, at the State Archive, and the State Library, and across the state, we've already been doing a lot of work on, but we need more. So that people like Mary Townsend Seymour, who is the founder of the first NAACP chapter in Hartford, and also very involved in the suffrage movement in 1919, when unfortunately a national association banned women of color from participating, so that her story can be more raised up. So that women like... So 
so that women like Minnie Glover and Daisy Dan Daniels and Mrs. Dimmick, who I've yet to find her first name, but I am going to, because I don't want to call her by her husband's name, they were the first three African-American women to vote in Hartford in 1920. We need to raise those stories up. So that is some of the work that we are doing at the Historical Society and how we can support um, your town history organizations as well. I do want to mention um, Connecticut Humanities and Scott Wands is here. Um, as our State Humanities Council, they have funding both um, quick grants programs as well as larger grants that you can apply to to support doing these initiatives because we know it takes money to do this work. Um, and he wanted me to make sure that municipalities know that they can apply directly as well. You don't have to necessarily go through a not-for-profit. I'm sure Scott would be happy to answer more questions later. This is our year to make some noise, as our First Lady encouraged us to do, and we can only do that when we lift up this history and we work together and we really celebrate the amazing accomplishments of the women and men who fought for the, fought for the passage of the 19th Amendment. Thank you so much, and I'm so thrilled that we're gonna be celebrating this achievement. Wonderful. Um, Thank you to everyone who spoke. You can see there's a lot of activity already. Hopefully some resources you can all plug into and use and exercise. Uh, we obviously stand on the shoulder of giants, as they all say, and I have no doubt that our celebration will make the suffragists proud. Now is our time to continue the work of those women. So as Carrie Chapman Catt said, to the wrongs that need resistance, to the right that needs assistance, to the future in the distance, give yourselves and let's make some noise. Thank you very much. I like that, it's good. And now I'd like to invite you all to join us downstairs. Um, it's outside the Prudence Crandall statue downstairs. We're having a press event and presentation of the Centennial Award to the League of Women Voters and the Delta Theta Society. So thank you very much for joining us. I look forward to working with you all. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. We uh, just had a great meeting upstairs. Um, and uh, thank you for joining us on this very exciting day. We are launching the statewide celebration of the 100th anniversary of women earning their right to vote. We're celebrating. <laughs> Along with the Lieutenant Governor and the First Lady of the State of Connecticut, uh, we will be co-chairing this commission and uh, we are very excited about it. And without further ado, I will turn this over to Lieutenant Governor Susan Bicewitz, one of the co-chairs and a good friend uh, for further comments. Thank you, Madam Secretary, for your wonderful efforts to bring us together for this celebration. And I want to thank the First Lady and First Partner, Annie Lamont, for being one of our co-chairs. I'm very excited to co-host this effort. We are at a critical time in our history. And while we are celebrating the expansion of rights, we know here at the Capitol uh, in Hartford and at the Capitol in Washington, D.C., we have to fight against uh, those who want to take rights away. And so while this is a historical celebration, it's also important to think about the future uh, because while uh, all women finally uh, in the aftermath of the Civil Rights Act have the right to vote, we have not achieved full equality yet, right? right. Not in terms of health care, not in terms of pay, not in terms of so many opportunities. We do not have 50% of our legislature, uh, legislators who are women here and in Washington. There is much work to do, but I do want to give a shout out to our governor who has chosen 52% of his 
executive leadership team, that are women and 40% are people of color. We are proud of our historic team and we are leading the way by example. But we're here at this press conference to say, we need your leadership in every community across Connecticut, in the halls of this legislature, and we need you to take the message to Washington that the fight for full equality and opportunity for everyone is not done. So count on the Secretary of the State, the Governor, uh, our First Lady, and our legislators to keep fighting that fight, and we thank you for joining us in it. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. And now I'd like a few words from our First Lady, who has been a leader in corporate governance, as well as other issues of women's leadership in her own right, and so we are very proud to have her as co-chair of this commission. Annie Lamont. I'll just be very brief, but I, we have some phenomenal female leadership on this team with Susan and Denise and a number of great female legislators, um, but I'm just happy to be here with uh, all the great women uh, to think about the importance of what was done for us 100 years ago and how that laid the groundwork for um, uh, under the next 100 years. And we, uh, we were just talking uh, in the last session about remaining vigilant and making noise because the reality is, is we still have work to do. So make noise, women. Let's get out there. Thank you so much. I think uh, our first lady has coined the new phrase for this uh, commission, make noise. <laughs> so this celebration is all about collaboration. And absolutely vital uh, to this celebration are the 30 plus members of organizations that make up our commission who bring each a unique, diverse, and invaluable perspective to the table. Uh, and the list of those organizations can be found in the packets we gave out earlier. Uh, and uh, we're hoping to even add to those numbers uh, as we go along through the year. But today, we're here in the Hall of Flags to recognize two of those organizations whose contributions and work improve the lives, not only of women in Connecticut today, but women all across their country since their inception. So today I am presenting the Centennial Award, the first of our celebration, to two of our member organizations. And I can think of no better way to kick off the coming year than to recognize the value of their work. This award recognizes individuals and organizations who have shown outstanding service and dedication in promoting voter participation, democracy, and women's equality, just as the suffragists fought over 100 years ago. So, without further ado, I would first like to congratulate the women of the Delta Sigma Theta sorority for their tireless work in improving the lives of black women across our country and in Connecticut. And I would ask that they would come forward. I want to say a little bit about the work of these women. They're familiar figures here at the Capitol. They come frequently every year uh, to make us aware of the work they're doing. They were founded nationally in 1913 by 22 collegiate women at Howard University. The Delta's mission is to provide support to local communities with, with a focus on black communities. The local Hartford chapter was founded in 1947, and we're lucky enough to have that chapter as a member organization of our Centennial Commission. So I'd like to present the Hartford chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority with the first ever Centennial Award and invite them to say a few words. So I'll read this out. 
uh, the Office of the Secretary of the State of Connecticut, Secretary of the State Denise Merrill, that's me. On behalf of the Connecticut Suffrage Centennial, I present this to the Delta Sigma Theta Sorority. This distinguished award recognizes your many outstanding contributions to promote voter participation, build a healthy and inclusive democracy, and advocate for women's equality. Our communities are strongest when everyone has a voice. We thank you for your commitment toward the realization of these goals. And I especially want to recognize my friend uh, Blanche Tucker, who has been a leader in the Deltas for many, many years and has done outstanding work. So congratulations, Blanche. And Good morning. My name is Blanche Reeves Tucker, and I'm the Connecticut State Coordinator for Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. To the co-chairs, my boss, <laughs> Secretary Mira, and in the absence of my other boss, um, who I used to work for, Secretary um, Lieutenant Bicewicz, and for Lady Lamont, and all the commission members that are here today, and everybody that's here in attendance, I want to say thank you. In memory of our 22 founders, and on behalf of our national president, Beverly Evans, our national first vice president, Cheryl A. Hickman, our regional director, Rosa Blackwell Lawrence, members in Connecticut of Delta Sigma Theta, and our 250,000 members across the United States and in the various islands, we want to say thank you. We are humbled today, extremely humbled, because in 1913, January 1st, 1913, 22 courageous, forward-thinking women of Delta Sigma Theta on Howard University's campus stepped forward in their first official march was the Women's Suffrage March. Imagine parents, 22 women who stepped out going to college and they decided to make their first official mark as a march. I'm sure their parents were frightened and I'm sure they were but they were forward-thinking and stepped forward, and they made that advancement for the 250,000 members of Delta Sigma Theta, the women that are here today, and the other women, the opportunity to be able to march and step out and be able to vote. So as our symbol says, we are the first to vote, we're the first to the polls, and we are thankful for the privilege that we have to be free today. Thank you all very much. The ratification of the 19th Amendment was in 1920, and it enfranchised 30 million women, the largest expansion of democracy in the history of the country, and still stands today as that. However, many of these women never had received a civic education, which created a new ballot uh, obstacle to the ballot box. That's when the recipient of our next award stepped in and armed a new generation of women voters with the confidence and know-how to shape public policy. Founded six months before ratification of the 19th Amendment, the League of Women Voters has been educating women about civics for 100 years and making sure they are able to exercise their hard-won right to vote. So without further ado, I present the Centennial Award to the Connecticut Chapter of the League of Women Voters. Congratulations. So again, the Office of the Secretary of the State of Connecticut awards the Centennial Award to the League of Women Voters of Connecticut. This distinguished award recognizes your many outstanding contributions to promote voter participation, build a healthy and inclusive democracy, and advocate for women's equality. Our communities are strongest when everyone has a voice, and we thank you for your commitment toward the realization 
of these goals for 100 years. Congratulations. to stand here and accept this award on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Connecticut and the many women and men who have supported our mission for almost a hundred years. Uh, and a number of them are here today and I thank them for joining us. When the League was founded on February 14, 1920, yes, Valentine's Day, we were the Valentine. <laughs> the stated purpose that day was to form a nonpartisan organization which would develop a high quality of intelligence and self-directing activity in the woman voter and a program of legislation. Women in Connecticut, after the Connecticut ratification of the 19th Amendment, which we are celebrating here, uh, joined this effort on January 18, 1921. And we haven't stopped yet. Over the years, we have registered millions of voters shared vital voting information, held forums on many important and timely issues, and advocated for those issues so that we could empower voters and defend democracy. We will be celebrating our 100th anniversary next February, and we hope you will all join us that day. As the League looks to our next 100 years, we are eager to continue our efforts and to encourage active participation in government. As our founder, Carrie Chapman Catt said, everybody counts in applying democracy, and there will be no, never be a true democracy until every responsible and law-abiding adult in it, without regard to race, sex, color, or creed, has his or her inalienable and unpurchasable voice in government. And we will believe that and carry on for the next 100 years. Thank you. So we are so grateful to all of you for being here today. Uh, congratulations to the winners of our Centennial Award. We're going to have a great year, and I'm counting on all of you to help us out. So let's go make some noise. Yeah.